Heart attacks and strokes are a leading cause of death for African Americans. We urge you, know the symptoms and don't avoid the hospital during this pandemic. Bear thanks the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for highlighting this important topic. Good morning and afternoon, everybody. I would like to welcome everyone tuning in with us today for our first ever virtual ALC panel session called Tech Talk, the Future of Diversity and Inclusion in Tech. My name is AJ Malikton. I'm the Director of Operations to Congressman G.K. Butterfield, who represents North Carolina's 1st Congressional District. First off, I would like to say that I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe through this pandemic. I want to thank our honorary co-host, Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California, and my boss, Congressman G.K. Butterfield of North Carolina, for joining us today, along with our special guest, Congressman Joe Nagus of Colorado, and our esteemed moderator and panelists who will be introduced soon. I especially want to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, T-Mobile, MasterCard, and Bayer for presenting our virtual session today. We will have T-Mobile's Vice President of Federal Government and External Affairs, Marie Silla Dixon, on to provide special video remarks. But before I introduce our moderator who will lead this session, I would like to briefly mention to our audience what Tech 20 is, Tech 2020 is. In 2015, Tech 2020, became an initiative, initiative led by the CBC's Diversity Task Force, which is co-chaired by Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Congressman G.K. Butterfield to address the lack of diversity in the fast-growing tech industry. Mm -hmm. It was said that then that in the year 2020, there would be an estimated 70% of new tech jobs that would go unfilled, which outpaces the rate of colleges and universities producing qualified graduates for these specialized roles. African Americans are a largely untapped talent pool that can help close this gap. Well, we fast forward to the year 2020 and Tech 2020's milestone year. And this is where we'll we begin our discussion today on this very important topic. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator. She was the executive director and general counsel to the Congressional Black Caucus in the 112th Congress under the leadership of Congressman Emanuel Kleber. She is the principal and CEO of Impact Strategies and a political commentator on CNN and political analyst on NPR. Ladies and gentlemen, Angela Rye. Thank you so much, AJ. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. I can tell you um, from firsthand experience, the work of um, the CBC Tech 2020 um, in concert with all of the work that Rainbow Push has done uh, has resulted in monumental shifts in the tech industry, whether we're talking about hiring um, consultants, which I'm one for full disclosure, um, and the research that's done by uh, the Kapoor Center and all of the other ways in which they're fighting every day to ensure that people who look like us have opportunity. I'm so grateful for the leadership of Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Congressman G.K. Butterfield, who I call Dad Three and have the privilege to now introduce he represents North Carolina's first congressional district, that is Wilson, North Carolina, co-chairs the CBC's Diversity Task Force, of which Tech 2020 is a part, a member of the prestigious Energy and Commerce Committee and House Administration, and he also served as the CBC chair in the 114th Congress. Dad Three, you now have the floor. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so very much. Well, the moment has finally arrived. Let me say welcome to all of you to today's special annual, annual legislative conference virtual panel discussion. Uh, this is entitled Tech Talk, the Future of Diversity and Inclusion in Tech. And so I want to publicly thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation uh, for its work and thank you for enduring the pandemic uh, because I know you've faced great challenges as we've tried to promote the ALC events of this year. So thank you so very much to the foundation and thank you to the sponsors. Uh, this week could not be possible without uh, our sponsors, including T-Mobile and MasterCard and, and Bayer. Thank all of you for the role that you have played. As, as my uh, daughter Angela said a moment ago, I am Congressman G.K. Butterfield. I'm a 16-year congressional member from Eastern North Carolina. Uh, now I'm a senior member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce. I don't know how that happened. It just happened over the years. And I started off being the most junior member of the committee, and now I'm in seat number six. And so I'm delighted to, to greet all of you today. I'm also proud to serve as co-chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Diversity Task Force, along with my dear friend, my dear, dear friend and colleague, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. 
Uh, Barbara Lee has been nothing less than a stalwart advocate for African-American inclusion in the tech sector and in every sector. This is her passion. Thank you so very much, Barbara Lee, for your friendship and for all the work that you do on behalf of, of our communities. Today, my friends, the discussion will surround the need for a critical upgrade in the tech industry. African-American inclusion in the industry and leadership roles with strong decision-making power. Minorities and women, I will say African-Americans and women. You know, when I was chair of the Congressional Black Caucus some years ago, uh, I was continuously reminded by a former member of Congress that we are the Congressional Black Caucus. We are not the Congressional Minority Caucus. And while we support all of our caucus and caucuses and we do it enthusiastically, we want to specifically talk about African-American diversity. African-Americans and women are notoriously underrepresented in our nation's tech industries. We have found that out in a very painful way. In 2015, African-Americans made up only 2.2% of Silicon Valley's technology workforce. Just think about that, only 2.2%. To date, improvement of those percentages has been incremental. It's been incremental, but it's been incremental at best. We are moving the needle, but the needle is moving very slowly. Despite widely accepted research findings touting the benefits of diversity and inclusion for corporate success, there remains a persistent lack of racial and gender and ethnic diversity in the tech workforce. Given these statistics, the Congressional Black Caucus has focused its efforts on ensuring that technology companies hire, that they hire diverse candidates and that underrepresented student populations are equipped to succeed in the tech workforce. In May of 2015, the Congressional Black Caucus launched Tech 2020 to bring together the best minds in the corporate, nonprofit, education, and public sectors to chart a path towards increased African American inclusion at all levels of the technology industry. The goal of this initiative is to achieve full, not partial, full representation of African Americans at every level of the tech industry, and our plan is to do it by the end of 2020. The lack of African-American representation in tech means that many, so many of our best and brightest, the problem solvers, if you will, the critical thinkers, and those that challenge conventional, conventional thinking are not included, and America's global competitiveness suffers as a result of non-inclusion. Since the start of Tech 2020, the CDC has met with leading technology companies to develop solutions around Tech 2020's core mission and principles. Our members understand that each organization requires a unique approach to increasing inclusion and diversity. With this in mind, we have worked. Oh, have we worked. We have worked with companies and organizations. I think it was mentioned a minute ago, Rainbow Push. Yes, we've partnered with Rainbow Push and and other organizations to adopt inclusion plans that outline specific measurable steps for companies to increase recruitment and retention of African Americans. Tech 2020 continues. We continue to push for tech companies to begin making more robust and intentional investments in the communities that they serve. Since the start of Tech 2020, companies have made commitments They've made commitments to African-American inclusion, increased African-American representations on their boards. You should know that when Congresswoman Lee and I first started, we looked at the, at the top 20 technology companies and not a single African-American was on any of the boards. That's beginning to change. And thanks to the work of CBC, uh, CBC Tech 2020 and for the uh, work that Congresswoman Lee and I have, have uh, done. Uh, there's still much more work to be done in order to achieve equity in the tech sector. Companies must do everything in their power. They're not doing it. They must do everything in their power to foster an environment where underrepresented minorities can thrive. For tech companies to reach their highest potential with respect to both profit and impact, they must make a sincere effort to place minorities at every tier 
place African Americans at every tier of employment, from engineers, from the engineers that are creating the logarithms to the C-suite leadership who make their st strategic operational decisions and get paid. The public and private sectors must work closely with one another to promote accountability and close the diversity gap in tech once and for all. Today, our country is facing a pandemic that has upended the lives of everyone, but most especially those in the Black community. Look at the data uh, where the disparities we face have been absolutely amplified. Moreover, the increasing calls for racial justice and addressing the need to end systemic racism has made our work more important than ever. I am excited to hear, I am excited to hear the expert insight of our panelists today. I want to thank each one of them for their involvement, and I know each one of them individually uh, and know of the great work that they are doing, but I want to thank you. I want to thank you publicly for your work. I want to look for I look forward to pursuing uh, continued efforts of increasing working with you to increase African American diversity and inclusion at every single level of the tech industry. That is our challenge, that is our goal, that is what is before us. Thank you so very much for coming today. Thank you for participating. Thank you for listening and viewing. I hope this session is productive. Thank you, Congressman Butterfield. I now have the privilege to introduce to some of you and reintroduce to so many others, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. She is uh, representing the 13th Congressional District in Oakland, California. She is, of course, the co-chair of the CBC's Diversity Task Force, a member of the Appropriations Committee, uh, the chair of the CBC in the 11th Congress, which meant we had some really big shoes to fill and make sure that we kept her um, not only happy, but we were keeping her legacy alive. She is the only Black woman in Democratic leadership and serves as the co-chair of the Steering and Policy Committee. Congresswoman Lee, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for that very warm introduction. But also, let me just thank you for continuing with your work uh, in the space you, you find yourself now in your work for racial justice and equity. Uh, we miss you on the Hill, but you're doing such phenomenal work uh, on the outside. And so we couldn't do this without you. The inside outside push and strategy is extremely important for any type of transformation to occur in this country within any industry, especially the tech sector. So thank you so much. To, uh, and my friend, uh, Congressman Judge Butterfield, he's my judge. I want to <laughs> thank you. Nice seeing you, uh, Judge Butterfield. And I want to uh, just uh, say one thing about you and, and your leadership. Because when uh, Congressman Butterfield was chair of the CBC, we talked about uh, looking at all Fortune 500 companies. And uh, Congressman Butterfield looked at the data and looked at the unbelievable lack of diversity and inclusion. And we were trying to figure out a strategy on how to move forward. So uh, I said, well, look, you know, since the 90s, I've been dealing with Silicon Valley and my constituents who never have had a chance to break through my, our African-American uh, men and women. And so why don't we look at the tech sector? And to his credit, Congressman Butterfield looked at that as our chair, and he said, yes, you're right. Let's, let's work together to try to use what we could do with the CBC uh, and start with the tech sector. So thank you, Congressman Butterfield. Your leadership has been uh, tremendously important and being a member of ENC, boy, I can't believe you're that senior now on the committee uh, because there's so much in terms of the jurisdiction of the tech sector that your committee um, has oversight on. And so uh, it's so important that we're at this point now with you on that committee. So thank you again very much. Um, it really has made a difference. And also for the Congressional Black Caucus to continue with a sustained effort through our different uh, chairs to continue with the push on the diversity subcommittee and task force as, as it relates to CBC Tech 2020. So thank you again. And also nice seeing uh, our, not our newest member, but a, a member that we have just started working with, Representative Joe Nagusk from Colorado. Uh, I tell you, he hit the ground running. I don't believe he's, he won't be a freshman much longer, but it seems like he's been there in the, on the Hill at least 20 years. So he comes with a wealth of knowledge and commitment 
and he's in a leadership representing um, his class. And uh, I'm so glad you're with us today, uh, Congressman Nagus, because this is such an important issue. I know in Colorado, uh, all of the issues that you're dealing with, my, actually my grandson goes to school there, to college there. So uh, you're his, his representative, good to see you. Also, um, let me just take a moment to thank our sponsors also, because we couldn't do this without you. And the CBCF, the foundation has just been a phenomenal partner with us in terms of pushing this agenda forward as uh, Rainbow Push. Um, and Reverend Brian, thank you so much, because Reverend Jackson, I just have to say, uh, led the way, uh, pushing hard for the release of the data, because without the release of the data, we wouldn't even have the information to be able to move forward. Still, all of the companies have not done that, but with yourself and Reverend Jackson pushing uh, at least we've begun that process and the companies know they cannot go back. So give Reverend Jackson um, our love, our regards, and uh, thank him for being such a, a tremendous um, role model leader, uh, human rights, civil rights, a fighter for econo economic justice on so many fronts. Uh, and of course, the Kapoor Institute located in my district, Allison, <laughs> thank you very much. Again, a, you know, working with outside external partners such as Angela and Allison and, and Reverend Brian, this is the only way we can do this. And so, uh, Nicole, yourself, uh, you know, this is, I think, that one of the best examples of how we work together on to achieve our goals. And that's what we have to do as African Americans. A couple of things. Uh, Reverend Jackson reminded us that this is not just about diversity, but it's about racial equity racial equity and racial justice in the tech sector. And uh, Judge Butterfield went over quite a bit of the statistics and the history, which uh, was really phenomenal. And I'll just add a couple things to that. Uh, first of all, in terms of just, um, and I wanna give you an example of how much further we still have to go, even though we've made some tremendous progress. We visited several times the tech companies in Silicon Valley, also in New York. And um, we talked about first time around making sure that uh, when there were openings, because as Mr. Butterfield said, there were no uh, board members, that um, when there are board openings, we wanted to make sure that African Americans were appointed to those boards. We went back the next year, and I'm not gonna mention the name of the company, but Congressman Butterfield remembers very well, there had been two, two board openings at this one company in Silicon Valley. And guess what? They did, not, they did not appoint one African-American to that board at all, period, dot, dot. And I share that with you because this has got to be a continuous oversight and push uh, effort because this sector is not gonna do this uh, on their own. Uh, and when you talk about uh, unconscious bias, we visited many companies that had begun the unconscious bias uh, initiatives. Well, you know what? Um, and because of the culture, many of the uh, owners and many of the top individuals in these companies are, are white and they're from uh, Harvard and Yale and other business colleges. They hire people that they know. And so there's so many uh, unconscious efforts that really prevent African Americans from breaking through. And so we learned also that through the unconscious bias uh, initiatives, they learned a lot, fine, but many of the companies didn't implement <laughs> the findings and provide the agenda and the, the transformational policies that were needed that would reflect the outcomes of the unconscious bias kind of sessions that they had. And so we have to make sure that what they learned that they implement in, in policy. We also found that uh, very few companies contract with suppliers, that they have, they, they pay a lot of money for a, a lot of services, accounting, advertising, legal services, you name it. Very few African-American companies um, have been in the mix for that. Not sure where they stand now, but I hope that these companies, and, and I'd like to hear from some of our panelists whether or not they know whether or not these companies have begun to do business with African-American uh, businesses. Also, we learned in, that many of these companies, when you look at the, uh, jobs in these companies that there are probably 35 to 40 percent that are non-tech jobs that are good paying jobs and and so when they tell us that um 
they couldn't find any African Americans <laughs> for these jobs. Uh, we're saying, well, wait just a minute. Uh, you know, the, and that African Americans with the engineering degrees and the, with with the quote qualifications that they want for the tech sector are all working somewhere. So we said, well, what about the other forty <laughs> percent? You know, why don't you have black people? within those categories and they didn't have an answer for that so we have to make sure that not only we recognize that these are tech jobs but they are also non-tech jobs that uh, our people deserve to be able to uh, get because they uh, and they keep talking about well if you send us qualified black people and I say well you never say send us qualified white people so stop using even the language is so important about qualified every time we hear qualified you know so the, i'm sharing the, these kind of stories because it's the culture also within the tech sector which i know so well that we have to break uh in order for racial equity to be part of the new culture also uh we learned that once african americans and many of these companies um are employed the environment is so hostile because they have not uh, reordered the environment to make it culturally appropriate and relevant and comfortable for African Americans. And so many people leave, many African Americans leave after five or six months because they, the, the uh, hostility and the, uh, the fact that they keep, don't have an environment that's conducive to who they are uh, is such that, uh, hey, let's go somewhere else. You know, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, and in my area, for example, the cost of housing is so exorbitant until uh, we've asked the tech companies to make sure that they have, uh, you know, housing allowances, have salaries that will allow for African Americans either to move to the Bay Area or to Silicon Valley or wherever these tech companies are citing because the cost of living is exorbitant in a lot of these areas. And so we wanna make sure that, that our folks are paid well once they get into um, this sector. And so we've made a lot of progress, don't get me wrong, but boy, we have learned a heck of a lot in, in terms of the layers and how we have to unpeel all of the layers to make sure that we finally get to some form of inclusion and equity. And, and finally, I'll just say, uh, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, and I wanna thank all of you for your help, but when President Obama was in office, we introduced the legislation Computer Science for All, which was a $350 million uh, bill, uh, his initiative to, to put funding in for our um, K through 12, primarily low-income black and brown students for computer science and technology training. Well, the bill, we're still building co-sponsors for, for the bill, but uh, on the Appropriations Committee, I've been able to write in to one of our accounts every year an additional 50, 100 million. So we're up to 150 million now uh, for computer science for all through the, uh, an account at the Department of Education. So I would encourage you that uh, the grants, I believe the notices have just gone out but uh, follow that for any of you who uh, are working with school districts and nonprofits, uh, especially in the tech sector, to partner with some of our organizations to try to submit grants applications for our computer science for all, because we've been single-handedly doing this uh, as a Black Caucus priority. And we've gotten, like I said, to about 150 million out of the 350 that we're trying to get toward. So we've got to make sure our young people also are part of this as they begin K, their, their uh, education, uh, K through 12, because that's where we've got to uh, begin. At the same time, we're trying to make sure that their parents uh, have access to the jobs and contracts and all of the benefits of the silicon of the uh, tech sector. So thank you again very much for being here for your leadership and for giving us a chance to work with you once again uh, during the ALC weekend. Uh, it's really a wonderful partnership and I have to thank the foundation for really picking up the ball and working with us and as well as the Kapoor Institute and uh, Reverend Jackson and Rainbow Push. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Ms. Lee. Um, at this time, we have our third and final uh, member of my CBC family who will speak to us. He's one of the newest members, first African-American member from, uh, of Congress from Colorado, representing the second congressional district. 
He's a member of the Judici Judiciary Committee and will speak um, on the ways in which the Judiciary Committee has been allies to um, CDC Tech 2020, also a member of the Natural Resources Committee and Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. And given these uh, four fires in California, we know that that is certainly needed. Uh, we also know that he is the co-freshman representative to the House Democratic Leadership uh, Committee. And I think that, um, I'm sorry, not committee, to House Democratic Leadership. At this time, I invite you all to hear from Congressman Joe Nagus. Well, thank you, Angela, uh, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all uh, for being here. It's wonderful to see you, of course, to share the virtual stage with uh, my friends and my mentors, uh, Judge Butterfield, and, and of course, the, the distinguished Representative Barbara Lee, both of whom have been such incredible mentors to me and uh, to many of the younger members of the CBC who you know, recently joined the Congress in 2018. Um, I'm delighted to be able to join ALC. Of course, I wish uh, we were all gathered together in person, but unfortunately, uh, the pandemic has presented us, as we all know, with some really unique challenges. Nonetheless, though, one of the, uh, the positive uh, <laughs> developments, I guess, is that my daughter, who's two years old, wouldn't normally be able to attend ALC, but she's able to join us today. So you might hear her in the background as she's watching some uh, Mickey Mouse. Um, I, I really am going to keep my remarks brief because I'm very much looking forward to this distinguished uh, group of panelists and experts who've been working in this field for quite some time to hear uh, what they have to say in terms of recommendations as to how we continue to redouble our efforts to make a tech uh, and excuse me, to make diversity in tech a reality uh, in the 21st century. But I'd be remiss if I didn't first say thank you to Representative Lee and to Judge Butterfield for their efforts. I can remember as a candidate running for Congress reading an article three years ago uh, about uh, both Barbara and uh, NGK going out and visiting with the tech companies directly to make the case about why uh, diversity needed to be at the top of their priorities list. And I was so impressed to see that uh, our leaders in Congress, and in particular the Congressional Black Caucus, were stepping up to the plate in such a robust and direct way. And to me, uh, it is reflective of their commitment to making sure uh, that African Americans are represented in tech writ at large, and ultimately emblematic of the commitment uh, and the seriousness of which they take their duties. And so again, very grateful to both of them for their efforts. And I don't know that I could say it any better than Judge Butterfield did, which is that there has been progress. It has been incremental. We are moving the needle, but the needle is not moving fast enough. And I can certainly attest to that here in Colorado, as was mentioned, I represent uh, the great state of Colorado, the second congressional district in particular, Boulder, Fort Collins, uh, several cities which have been noted uh, internationally as tech hubs. Uh, the Denver metro uh, region uh, has been identified as sort of the Silicon Mountain, right, in the Rocky Mountain West, uh, where we have uh, tens of thousands of jobs being created, uh, at least prior to the pandemic, on a uh, monthly basis here uh, in the state of Colorado in the tech industry, a thriving venture capital uh, space and an ecosystem in which startups and entrepreneurs are finding a lot of success. And yet there remains uh, structural inequities that uh, we have yet to address as a country and as a state. Uh, when you hear statistics like those that Judge Betterfield referenced, uh, another statistic that I just saw recently uh, from McKinsey uh, last year that only 4% of those in the tech industry are African American, uh, Latino, or Nat Native American women, uh, right? We know that there is a lot of work to do. And what I find refreshing about the work that Judge Butterfield and Representative Lee have done is while we all recognize it's critically important to focus on the pipeline, right? Um, that is an area which uh, has gotten a lot of attention, uh, rightfully so, but nonetheless, an area in which I think the solutions are uh, fairly straightforward. And, and I think there's a, a real risk of looking at that in a myopic way and ignoring the cultural problems that exist or the lack of political will to ultimately ensure uh, that uh, African Americans have a seat at the table. And so uh, when you hear Judge Butterfield and Representative Lee making the case that there need to be more African Americans, for example, as board members or in the C-suites of these companies, that matters. Um, it matters to create a, a more robust ecosystem for venture capital, right, for African Americans, because we know uh, that uh, the inability to access uh, that capital uh, really 
creates a really structural obstacle for our young African-American entrepreneurs and founders who are doing incredible innovative things and yet are unable uh, to, to scale up their operations, their products, their companies, uh, because they don't have access to the same uh, intergenerational wealth um, and uh, you know, the boardrooms in so many cases remain closed. So there's a lot of work for us to do. Uh, I know we all know that and that I'm preaching to the choir in some respects, but I hope that you all will know that the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, I believe, will continue to treat this uh, as a top priority because we have to. Uh, we know that in the coming decade, the majority of new jobs that will be created will be jobs in the tech industry, the tech sector. We know that those jobs will have a tremendous and profound impact on the American economy and, and our daily way of life. And that absent African-Americans having a seat at the table, uh, we know that that impact could potentially be a negative one. Facial recognition technology perhaps being a salient example, right? Uh, and the other ways in which we wanna make sure uh, that we have a voice in terms of developing the technologies of the future. So I thank you for your leadership and for all that you are doing. And I look forward to continuing to partner uh, with, uh, with you all. And of course, with Titans like GK and Barbara on the efforts ahead. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Congressman. At this time, um, we are gonna pause briefly for a uh, video from our sponsor, T-Mobile. Um, we will hear from Marie Silla Dixon, who is the Vice President of Federal Government and External Affairs for T-Mobile and responsible for shaping the company's public policy agenda. Hello, my name is Marie Silla Dixon, and it's my absolute pleasure to be here with you today. As a former Hill staffer myself and having spent the last 17 years of my career focused on tech and technology issues, you can only imagine how proud I felt when five years ago, in 2015, the Congressional Black Caucus launched CBC Tech 2020 to elevate much needed conversation around diversity and inclusion in the tech sector. While much progress has been made since 2015, what the present moment teaches us between the realities of living in a country where digital accessibility is a must as we continue to grapple with COVID and understanding that equity and meaningful inclusion in the economic life of this nation is still far off for many people of color is that there is much work yet to be done. In doing our part to affect positive change, T-Mobile is proud to have partnered with six prominent civil rights organizations last October as part of our merger with Sprint on a historic diversity memorandum of understanding. We have committed $25 million to various community initiatives as part of this work. And internally, we are changing and expanding our talent development programs to ensure more opportunities for employees of color to strengthen our talent pipeline up through and including the executive leadership level. T-Mobile has also committed to promoting more inclusive business practices, including diverse hiring through all levels of the company, deploying a 5G network that is more accessible to underserved communities and developing and executing on a long-term community investment plan. And as we've established an external diversity council that will guide us in making sure we can successfully execute our diversity plan. Furthermore, we have made major commitments to serve children in underserved communities to get access to broadband at a time when connectivity is essential for distance learning. Just last month, we announced Project 10 Million, a multi-billion dollar effort to help eradicate the homework gap for millions of children. The project provides free service, wireless hotspots, access to tablets and laptops to 10 million households over five years. This plan comes at the right time, especially as the digital transformation has been accelerated by the pandemic. As a Black woman, I am proud of T-Mobile for showing up asking questions and doing the work, both inside our corporate offices and retail stores and on the ground in communities across the country. But I know as an industry, we have much more work to do. I encourage all of my friends in the tech industry to take note 
and make a commitment to do better. You must do better. Our future generation is depending on us. I would like to thank Representatives Butterfield, Lee, and Nagus, and all of the CBC members for your leadership on this issue. And to the esteemed panelists participating in the discussions, thank you for lending your voice and being a champion so that all people have a seat at the table. T-Mobile stands with you, and we are committed to continuing to do the work to ensure that there is a level playing field for everyone in our community. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to our panelists who've joined us today. Of course, today's theme is Critical Upgrade, African-American Inclusion in Tech. Um, we know that uh, with Congressman Butterfield, Congresswoman Lee, and with Congressman Naboos, we have quite the, um, the foundation laid. And so what I want to do is just jump into a question that's got to be at top of mind for a lot of folks at home, and that is why tech? Um, and I want to start um, with you, Reverend Bryant, because I think it's important for people at home to understand that when it comes to the work of Rainbow Push, y'all didn't start with tech. So I would love for you just to give us a brief background on where you all started and how these issues actually play. Um, so Reverend Bryant, I want to go to you to talk about some of the work that Rainbow Push has done um, in other spaces, because these issues plague other industries. They are certainly rampant in tech, but we know that it's not new, as Congresswoman uh, Lee said, to hear qualified. We heard it even at the party, Miss Lee. So we want to talk about that just a little bit, and I think it makes the sure. most sense to go to you, Reverend Bryant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank you for uh, this wonderful platform to our congressional leaders. You all are incredible. Thank you so much. On behalf of Reverend Jackson, I extend to you both uh, gratitude and greetings uh, on his behalf. But let me also just say to all of my esteemed colleagues that this issue is so critical for us right now because we have the need to ensure equity at every level for our people. What I have discovered in my work with Reverend Jackson is that he decided that every place a door needs to be open for our people to have equal access and equal opportunities. That's the door he wants to knock down, open up, and then engage as much as possible to ensure that we can be included, not only at the table, but we can be participants in all of the things that every industry can provide. And so Angela, thank you for acknowledging the fact that for uh, the better part of 50 years, Reverend Jackson has been holding up this uh, stained banner uh, for us to have equal access in every area, the trade industry, uh, the business industry, Wall Street, one of our biggest initiatives, and all the various pieces that go along with our engagement uh, around this country to bring fairness for uh, African Americans and all people of color. Uh, that's been Reverend Jackson's uh, desire and design uh, for so many years. That being said, uh, here we are now engaging with the tech industry specifically. And uh, many of you know Reverend Jackson didn't start uh, just a few years ago in the new millennia. He actually began in the 90s meeting with Steve Jobs and Bill Great Gates and others uh, to just talk about what was evolving and how African Americans would be able to engage in this process, not just as consumers, but as participants at every level. And as was acknowledged by the Congresswoman uh, woman Lee, uh, Reverend Jackson didn't just want to see us uh, taking advantage of what technology offers us to uh, engage with all of the tools to have enjoyment, but to have economic stability and strength, employment, and other opportunity. And so here we are now in 2020, and really uh, we began along with the CBC in 2015 to have our uh, Push Tech Conference. And our idea of 2020 wasn't just the number of five years, but it was also a vision. 2020 is perfect vision, and we wanted to see a better Silicon Valley. We wanted to see more opportunities for our people. We want to see more opportunities at every level, at the C-suite level, at the board level, at the management level, at decision-making level, as well as the workforce level. And so what we are trying to engage constantly is fairness and equality, equity and opportunity. And that goes across the board as a platform of Rainbow Push. And Push Tech 2020 uh, has just run alongside with the CBC and their tech uh, initiatives. And we've been doing this work uh, very similarly 
and we cross paths and we uh, collate our resources and our networks in order to have impact. And that's where we are. And that's where we want to continue to push to make sure that all of us have access to education, to uh, employment and to economic stability. Thank you, Reverend Brian. I need you to push that microphone and that backdrop over here. I'm jealous of this tech setup, but he couldn't be the co-director of the Push Tech 2020 Silicon Valley Diversity Project without also having his own tech. I'm introducing him now because I was so eager to get into the conversation. I did not even introduce him, but I know him well, y'all. So welcome. Um, I want to turn over quickly to um, Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, um, with the work that you're doing at the Brookings Institution Institute as a, as a senior fellow and as a director for Center, the Center for Technology Innovation. Um, Nicole, I just have to ask you how important um, mining data to ensure that we are represented. I know Congresswoman Lee talked about us making up a mere 2.2 percent of the tech workforce. What are some of the things that we can do in addition to pulling the information to ensure that folks are accountable, both on where we are and two, on where we need to go? Oh, thank you, Angela. And actually, I want to say thank you to uh, Congressman Butterfield, who, if he's your daddy, I'm just sort of like the cousin, <laughs> and uh, to Congressman Lee, who we share the last name, so I assume that we're related. And to Congressman Nagus, I say thank you. I've been to Boulder, and I know just how hard it is to be the first African-American representative there. What I would say to you, Angela, and to the same colleagues is that Black lives matter in Silicon Valley. So just as we've seen it matter in terms of everything that we're going through, we need to keep reminding people that wherever we are, we matter. And I think what the CBC started years ago is actually the tipping point, the inflection point of why we as Black people need to be part of the decision-making process. To your point, Angela, if we're not making these products, we are the product, basically, right? Because our data, particularly now, as more data has been collected about African Americans during this COVID-19 crisis, our data is being harnessed in ways that will be weaponized against us if we don't have people at the table that can represent our interests. It's particularly important as we move forward that we ensure that African Americans are not just photo ops, but we're actually represented in the production of these products and services that Congresswoman Lee knows are impacting the way that we live our lives. They are transforming how we live, how we learn, how we you know, love in many cases, because the products and services of the new digital normal require the type of digital justice that the CDC is putting forth. I'm writing a book on this on US Digital Divide. In addition to having 18 million people who are not online, we have a lower percentage, two to three percent of people that are not actually in the corporations that are going to probably survive this, this new normal that we're actually going to come out of. So to your point, Angela, what do we do about it? I mean, one of the things I think that is really important is that we have to develop an equality index of some sort, a dashboard. We're not asking for people to be penalized for not hiring. We're asking people to at least try. And I think what CBC Tech has done is giving us an indication. I am so excited when I go to LinkedIn or other uh, properties and I see that somebody else has been placed, a new CEO, a new C-suite person, a new person that's developing an algorithm. People like me, I'm a public intellectual. I'm even sitting here with all of you. I'm doing my part, right? But we need to have ways to keep people accountable by at least publishing what they're doing. And I know that Allison is working on that at the core Center. I think it's also important, and I want to really highlight this. I was on a panel a couple weeks ago where another think tank did a report where they found out, much to what the congressman has said, people of color leave these corporations after four to five months. That is shameful. And what they found in this study is they're not leaving because they can't get their hair done or they're not leaving because they don't have no place to eat. They're leaving because they don't feel comfortable. And we are at a state right now that we don't feel comfortable being policed. We don't feel comfortable shopping while black. We should feel comfortable in the corporations in which we are contributor to the final outcomes and products. The new normal of tech, and I'll end here, because I'm not going to be like Reverend Brian and be a preacher, so I'm going to just get off my, my, <laughs> my, my pulpit and just say one last thing. The new digital normal that we're actually seeing has the ability to leave people behind. And we, as Black people, have to get into this game because the new jobs that will be created will come out of tech. The new products of tomorrow will come out of tech. We've got a pipeline issue, we've got a retention issue, and now we have a redo issue. And I think if we learn anything from this four, six months of this pandemic of how important it is to be connected, we need to learn that 
what CBC Tech started has to continue because at the end of the day, where we're actually going to see the much more influence in our society is around the digital ecosystem, the ecology that is basically driving the next economic output. So Angela, I think you're so right. Our data is our currency and these products are running off of this new fuel. So it's incumbent for us to keep pressing as this new uh, digital normal actually, you know, comes and encompasses our lifestyles so that we are represented. So thank you for having me. And I'll continue to write about it, uh, Congresswoman Lee, as you said, I'll, I'll continue to be a partner to the CBC, a place that I also call home. Thank you so much, Nicole. And speaking of CEOs, we have one up next, uh, Dr. Allison Scott, who is the CEO of the foundation of the Kapoor Center, um, also formerly the chief researcher, research officer, and led a team, speaking of ecosystems, Nicole, um, on what it means to enhance diversity in the tech ecosystem to ensure nobody's left behind. And so if we can start there, Allison, um, what are some of the things that companies can be doing um, to ensure, as Nicole just talked about, retention, that folks feel comfortable staying at work um, after they've contributed in such a real way? She talked about LinkedIn. Um, folks are constantly on LinkedIn trying to recruit for different posts and they get there, but how do we ensure they stay there and then they're able to open up the doors of opportunity for so many others as these two te uh, Tech 2020 initiatives have with Rainbow and with the CBC. And thank you, Angela. And um, thank you, Congresswoman Lee and Congressman Butterfield and uh, Congressman Nagus as well. I'm, I'm very honored to be here today and we are in such a critical moment. Um, as you both mentioned, Tech 2020 um, was really on the, on the leading edge of um, calling attention to the problem. And I think we've seen some progress as was just mentioned before, we've seen progress in um, the narrative shift around why it's important to focus on um, increasing diversity in tech. We've seen incremental progress, as was mentioned, on data. Um, but I think we have a long ways to go. And I think that we actually have an interesting moment um, in response to the Black Lives Matter protests and the displays of solidarity that have come out of the tech companies. I think we have a real opportunity to say, what is the commitment that you're willing to provide at this point to the Black community? Um, so um, a couple quick points that I wanted to make and when we think about the problems and we think about the framing of the problem, we have to understand that underrepresentation in tech is a structural problem. Um, it's based on historical policies and practices that have led to unequal access to education, employment, and wealth. Um, and we have to acknowledge the reality of the structural inequality. So we cannot tinker around the edges and think that one time small commitments are going to make any significant change. So a few of the things, um, and this is not new, but a few of the things um, that companies can and should be doing and we need commitments from the top. So we need CEOs to set explicit diversity goals, to allocate resources and appropriate authority to the um, chief diversity officers that are now being hired in mass. Um, and then the board should be holding the um, CEOs and the organizations accountable for meeting those goals, just like they would any other performance goals. Um, there are a whole set of policies and practices that should be implemented within companies so that we don't see the retention and turnover and the revolving door of black talent that's being hired into tech companies and being intentional about um, hiring retention and promotion practices, as well as developing the pipelines of talent. Um, and then two other points that I just wanted to make before we end, um, deployment of resources. So we know tech companies have significant CSR budgets um, that they're spending on things like diversity, on things like developing a pipeline. Um, I think we have an opportunity to be way more strategic in how those resources are allocated, um, how venture firms are investing in black businesses, um, and thinking about how do we advance the goals of racial equity and not just think of those budgets as handouts. And then finally, um, I just think it's important to note, um, similar to what Nicole mentioned, that in this moment, tech companies are not neutral. So I think it's important that tech companies also are participating in structural change across sectors. So thinking about broadband access, disparities in school funding, um, closing gaps in startup capital, tech companies have an important role to play. Thank you so much. I want to um, just kind of chime in with where a, a portion of what you just talked about, and that is um, the responsibility of VC firms. Um, we know that Black women uh, get 0.06% of um, VC funding and 81% of VC firms have no Black investors. So when you talk about structure, I think for some entities, they would think a structural change would be oh, I'll change the name of my DNI person 
to DEI for equity, right? And so while equity is a structural shift, can we for a minute you all talk about how equity in their job title is not sufficient for establishing equity in the company or even in the tech industry and some of the things you all are working on to establish real equity? I'll start with you, Reverend. Oh, oh go okay. Ahead. Okay, whomever, tag team. Um, let me just jump in and um, there's so many things that, that we need to address and I'm grateful for uh, my esteemed uh, uh, panel uh, is here, uh, Dr. Lee and, and Dr. Allison, both of you are doing phenomenal work. I think a couple of things need to be raised. One, we need to ask of companies uh, to give us some real data, some real EEO1 uh, reporting as to what their diversity and inclusion numbers are looking like so that there can be a more engaged reality around where those funds and or positions are being created. Um, and, and a lot of times reporting may, you know, be somewhat suspect because of the way they share their numbers. You know, they've had a 50% increase. Okay, they went from two people to three people. That's a 50% increase. Uh, but, you know, again, I think there's more to it than that. And so one of the things that we are consistently doing is asking companies, and we've really made a big push this year, even with the uh, pandemic and all of the uh, challenges around that, we're asking companies for their EEO1 numbers. We're also asking them to prepare uh, uh, to send us and to provide for not only Rainbow Push, but for organizations like the CBC and others, uh, some real manageable, sustainable, clear, distinguished, uh, identifiable uh, goals that can be measured. I think sometimes the blanket statements of where things are going to go uh, doesn't always uh, fit the bill, so to speak. We need to know specifically uh, what their strategies are, what their plans are, and it was said by, uh, by Dr. Allison, I believe, you know, this Black Lives Matter uh, openness uh, needs to have a strategy behind it and not just an announcement of X number of dollars that are being sent out into the cause because oftentimes that uh, can be generated through programs that they already have, that they're just uh, uh, utilizing their marketing strategy or utilizing their marketing uh, budgets for uh, more promotions opposed to more positions. And so what we want to see is more opportunities for decision making management and, and for the spreading of power to happen. Because as you said, uh, I think Angela's just so wonderfully is that we need people on the inside that are able to move the needle because they're able to have uh, the authority and the ability to not only be in the position, but to hire others to ensure pipelines are happening and to reach back to uh, the college crowds, to our inner cities, to our HBCUs, and ensure that we are actually developing a system. We are addressing the systematic issues and not just uh, putting a Band-Aid on the problem, but really addressing it from as many places as we can. All right. And if I could jump in, Angela, too, I think, Reverend Bryant, you're completely right in terms of putting some pressure on companies to actually give that data is really important. That's why at Brookings, we've been playing around with this equality dashboard. Like, what does an equity dashboard, equality dashboard look like in terms of accounting? The challenge that we've always had with tech platforms or tech companies in general, you go back a couple of years ago, the Department of Labor actually published some of that data and told us in terms of the inequities of hiring. But unlike a broadcaster, there's no enforcement. There's no accountability around the, uh, uh, the access to that information and what you do about it if you actually do not find that type of equitable distribution of people in decision-making capacity. I, mean, I think it's high time that we start to think about what does that look like to keep companies accountable, particularly those that contribute a large portion towards the GDP. What does that look like when we're talking about workforce development? What does that look like? I mean, we saw in the Black Lives Matter movement, I think I recall a lot of tech companies write checks in support of the social justice efforts. But some of those companies weren't even diverse at the top to actually write a check without making sure that they had people who were working as decision makers who would pull some of those activists who are young scholars into the mix. I chair a subgroup for the FCC on diversity in tech. And there's a lot of young startups that we're actually in this paradigm, and I think Dr. Scott and Dr. Brian, you could actually talk to this, of, of ecology shifting of black startups. It's sort of the age old discussion. Well, we can't find anybody. We don't know where they are. Well, there are tons, Angela, to your point, of black startups that if given access to capital could actually become the next big idea, the next big company the next big supplier of many of these corporations in which we reference. And because tech is no longer big tech, tech is everything we touch from shopping to commerce to banking. 
it's important as we grow this initiative to think about the infiltration of technology in all facets of life. Where do we place the accountability in financial services and other areas where technology will be available? And I would say this, Angela, too, to your point, the other challenge that we have, and we won't have enough time to talk about it, the other part of my portfolio is on artificial intelligence and algorithmic bias. We have a lot of bias that is embedded in tech products simply because we don't have representation of people who know the civil rights laws, of people who understand that representation and inclusivity matters. And so I think as we continue to evolve this, we have to sort of go back to that age old tool. Uh, Tom Wheeler works in me said, I read in the New York Times that tech companies are finally trying to get that diversity really sells. Well, they should have known that <laughs> because most of the population looks like us. We're the top consumers of many of these tech products and uh, platforms. And so I think going forward to your point, we need to have those metrics. We need to create some type of accountability structure and have some levels of enforcement if we don't see the type of, of inclusivity that we wanna see. We need to build upon the tech startup ecosystem of black uh, entrepreneurs who have something to contribute. And then I think finally, we need to start looking at the future and what emerging technology is actually going to bring if we continue to have the lack of representation. Thank and if you. I can, can um, I build on that and add just two quick points? Um, so as was mentioned, I think the, the VC space plays such an a critical role because it um, decides which companies and products get funded and there's literally billions of dollars at stake. So in 2019, there were $137 billion invested in 10,000 startups and just 1% are black founders and 0 0.06 of venture funding since 2009 has gone to black women. So just two data points to, to illustrate the problem. Um, and I think the data point is also really helpful because if you think about EEO1 reports that are required for firms that have over 100 um, employees, venture firms are by and large fewer than 100 employees. So I think we need robust data on venture capital firms, who are their investors and who are they investing in? Um, and then thinking about how do, we, um, how do we increase the number of black investors hired, the capital that's actually being deployed. I feel like that's the data that we should be prioritizing. How much capital is being deployed to black founders? Is that number increasing? And then holding these venture capital firms accountable. It sounds like maybe one takeaway today could be a partnership with Brookings, Kapoor Center, and Rainbow Push on this VC search. I think that's important. Don't you think so, Congresswoman Lee? I, um, I want to come to you all uh, last on this. We only have a few minutes remaining. Um, Allison and Nicole, you both brought up Black Lives Matter. We know this year has demonstrated to us, as Reverend Bryant said, a year of perfect vision 2020, what was perfected is our clear-eyed friends now on structural racism in healthcare and health systems, and certainly um, with policing um, and, and, the, and the lack of support in our communities. Um, and so when I think about what it means to ensure that Black Lives Matter in tech, that Black Lives Matter holistically, Nicole, as you talked about, I think it's so important that we leave people with one thing they can do to ensure that they're represented, not just as consumers, but as owners, not just as owners, but in C-suite leadership roles and senior leadership roles in companies. Um, not just that, but also as vendors and as providers of services to these varying um, uh, tech companies. What are some things that we can do to ensure that we're seen, we're heard, and we are represented um, in tech so that we can ensure Black Lives Matter everywhere and we can lead with that. It has to be quick. Vote, encourage learning, and learn as much as you can yourself and invest back into your community. I'll just be quick, you know, make the product, don't be the product. I'll just end there. You, we gotta be in the middle of this evolution because this evolution is going to transform our entire lives. And we can sit back and we can watch it and watch our public, public welfare system deteriorate, or we can actually say and take on tech as one of our big rock civil rights concerns going forward. And last comment, just I would echo, we must all vote. And I think we all have individual and collective power and there are power that employees have in organizing and, and being whistleblowers from within. Shareholders have a, an important role to play. Consumers and their purchasing power have a role to play. I think we all have power and I think, um, this is a, a time that we cannot um, overlook the importance of increasing diversity in tech. And vote. I wanted to say vote too, Angela. I want to say vote too. Because <laughs> I feel bad.
if you're black, you better vote. That's the message from this panel. I want to say really quickly, um, thank you so much to our panel. I want to ensure that I give yield the floor back to our chair of the CBC Diversity Task Force for Closing Words, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Thank you so much. Listen, this has been an extraordinary uh, panel and I have learned a lot and, and of course, uh, in my mind now, I have a few more ideas that I think members of Congress uh, can do. You know, we have sticks and carrots, right? Uh, and at some point, I mean, we've been dealing with the carrots and we've been working very hard and we've made some progress as all of you have laid out, but you also have laid out how much further we have to go uh, given the nature of systemic racism in the tech sector. So I'll just close by saying we all serve on committees, you know, and, and we don't like to do a lot of regulations, but sometimes regulatory reform uh, comes into play. And so as we move forward out of this, yes, vote is extremely important, but just know that those of us uh, are gonna continue to work with uh, all of you uh, as our partners, but at some point, we're gonna have to look at taking the next steps. And so let's hope that uh, out of today, uh, we can um, send, the, send the message very clearly that not only uh, are we gonna not stay where we are, but we're gonna rev up our efforts and move forward because in this moment, as everyone has said, of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives do matter and they matter in the tech sector. And we're gonna make sure that uh, there's racial justice and equity and that we break the barriers of systemic racism in, in the tech sector. So just know out of today, uh, you know, we have our marching orders from our panelists and Angela, thank you so much for making sure that, uh, that uh, everything is very clear in terms of the outcomes of, of this panel. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the time. Shout out to the CBC Foundation's annual legislative conference. We hope you all are staying safe, wear masks, and most importantly, vote. Thank you so much.